Welcome to Lamis.com in our lab video series on Cisco Wireless LAN Controller. You can find a playlist of Wireless LAN Controller videos on our website by clicking on the link above and sign up for our newsletters to receive the latest video updates. In the past, using the command line was pretty much the only method you can use to initialize a Cisco Wireless LAN Controller. But now in the more recent code release, Cisco has made the process also available in GUI, initially on the 2500 series controller platform. And now with the latest code release, we begin to see the same features appear on the other control platform as well, like a 5508. In this lab, we are going to cover basic installation, both from the command line perspective and the GUI using our Cisco 2504 wireless LAN controller. So let's take a look at our lab setup. We kind of have two identical setup going on here. So for us to use and play around with the different initialization method. What we have in terms of hardware is Cisco wireless LAN controller 2504 running the version 8.1 with a directly attached Cisco AP3702 on port number three on the controller. On port number one, we use it as our data trunk uplink to our switch. On the setup on the left-hand side, it's connected to switch port five on the VLAN 32, and we'll be assigning an IP of .104. And on the right-hand side, the setup is connected to the switch port seven, but on a different VLAN, VLAN 33 with this subnet right here, and we also have an IP of .104 of that VLAN. And on the left, we have our Windows 2008 VMs that we're going to be using as our jump box and console into our controller. So the setup on the left-hand side, we'll start using that for our command line initialization. And on the right-hand side setup, we will be using that for the GUI. That's why we have our setup PC right here plugged into port 4 ready to go so we can access our controller via IP. At this point, all of the devices where there's a controller and the APs has been reset to the factory default, so we should be ready to go and should be sitting at the start of the initialization process. That's the prerequisite at this point. You should know your network parameters, which is things like IP information, the default gateway, VLAN IDs, or even the NTP server IPs. What we are going to begin with here is the method number one, which is to using the command line interface to accomplish our controller initialization, which is the traditional way. And this pretty much works on all of the controller models. So we're just going to start with that. SSF today is still probably the most popular way since it's uh, supported on all the platform. The first thing we're going to do here is to console into our controller number one. And we kind of have that set up already through our Windows 2008. So let me bring up the RDP session to the Windows 2008. You can see we are sitting here at the start of our wizard. But before we actually proceed, I just want to show you here, since this guy just finished booting, and kind of show you some of the messages since it will get scroll past the screen at the top. That's what I want to show you right now. So some of the things that's showing here is how it was enabling the controller provisioning. And this section right here has got to do with the GUI method of initialization, which we'll take a look at late, a little bit later on. So it's telling us that's the configuration of the management interface and starting the internal DHCP server with the starting IP of 192.168.1.3 uh, all the way up to 1.14. So this way, once you get the LAN connectivity, whether it's through the wire or wireless Ethernet, you will be receiving the IP through a DHCP. And we will see those in the second half of the video. Same thing here is enabling the management via wireless. And that's pretty much the third method, which is using the GUI, but instead of directly connected to the controller, we'll be doing that over the wireless. So that's why the controller came up with a provisioning SSID called Cisco Air Provision, which we will later on connect to the SSID and perform our provisioning over wireless. Okay, so just as the side note on that. So now let's move on with our command line initialization. So the first question is whether or not to terminate auto install. By default, it said yes. Let's so go ahead and hit enter. Then we need to provide a system name. So first we're going to call it lm-wlc1. Again, all of the information is pretty much displayed right here on the diagram. So lmwlc1. Give it a admin username. We'll just use an admin and then provide the password, make sure the complexity satisfies the system requirement. Then we need to decide whether or not to enable link aggregation or lag. At this point, we don't want to deal with that just quite yet since we're going to have a separate video talking about the controller interface redundancy. 
So by default, you can see capitalize is no. So enter. Measure IP for us will be 172.16.32.104. Submit mass is slash 24. Default gateway 32.1. And our VLAN ID, again, it's recommended to make sure that you have a VLAN tag and not use the native VLAN for the controller. So give it VLAN 32. We have to pick management interface since this is a 2504 that has four physical Ethernet ports. We have to pick one of the four. For now, we'll pick number one as our interface port for management. And it's asking us to provide the DHCP server IP. At this point, I'm just going to point to our default gateway, which is the switch.16.32.1, and we'll deal with the DHCP server setup in a separate video. Now the virtual gateway IPs, without going into too much detail of what it really is, there's just a proxy IP that the controller used to intercept if you do things like a layer three web authentication. So what this IP has to be is an IP that doesn't exist anywhere in the network better yet, the IP that is reserved and should never be used. It used to be a popular IP of 1111, but since that has become a actual public IP, so what has actually been replacing that IP is a 192.0.2.1. And if you look that up, it's just one of the reserve lab IPs. So we can use that for this purpose. Hit enter multicast IP. We're just going to give it uh, something for now. We'll deal with that later when we actually look at multicast routing on the controller. So we're just going to give it some IP from the 239 range. So 239.111. Next is the mobility groups. Let's just give it a pretty a simple name. So LM-MG. Again, don't worry too much about what these really are. And you know, once we get to the video of that particular feature, we'll explain all of these. Give something logical, lm-mg. It looks like it's going to be using the same group name for the RF group as well. So hit enter. It's also asking us to create a WLAN SSID. Let's create one, which later on we can delete. temp-wlc1, just to kind of distinguish that that this is SSID is being broadcast by our controller number one. Bridging mode. Let's have uh, keep that turned off, so answer no. Allow static IP address. Unless you have a need to allow your wireless client to have a static IP assigned, then you should be choosing no here. And that's for a better security as well. For a rated server, Probably not at this point. We'll deal with that when we look at the layer two authentication. So no. All right, next is the country code list. By default, it's US, so you just need to enter an appropriate country. Now it's asking to whether or not we want to enable 82.11b network, and that's not really specific to B, it's actually the BGN in general. If you plan to configured all the radio specific parameters right after the initialization, you probably want to keep this turned off for, for now, since uh, some of the radio features require the radio to be turned off. So we're going to answer no here, as well as the 802.11a radio frequency. We do no. Auto RF, most likely you want to keep this setting as yes. Just kind of let the controller system figure it out, all the RF parameters for you. NTP server, highly recommended, if not almost mandatory. So set yes. Our NTP server IP is in this lab. We're just going to use our switch one loopbacks, and switch one can also be, or actually it's, we have configured to provide NTP uh, service as well. Since we have this time sync to the internet, so we're just going to enter as loopback, which is 172.16.0.10, enter polling interval. Since it's a lab, we can keep it uh, fairly low, so 3600. IPv6, we're not going to bother with IPv6 at this point, so unless you're planning to have a network to support IPv6, we can pretty much say no to that. And now we get to the end. Make sure everything looks correct, and we just need to confirm by 
saying yes. Okay, so the configuration will be safe. And the controller will go into a reload. All right, so you can see that once you get to the end and finish the CLI, the controller went back and started cleaning up the internal DHCP server as well as the provisioning SSID since the system assumes that you no longer need those as you have completed the initialization through the CLI instead of the GUI. All right, and they're just going to have to wait for our controller to come back. And while we're waiting for that, let me show you how we have our switch port configured right now for our controller number one on port five. So let me bring up the console to the switch. Right here, lm switch one. I'm just going to do show run interface 105. You can see the configuration is fairly straightforward it is switch port trunk, encapsulation dot one Q, mode trunk. No negotiate, which is one of those recommended or best practice to have the command in there. Another command that is also recommended to have is the allow VLAN command. So that way you just lock down the port to whatever VLANs that you want to allow to the controller. We just don't have it here because later on we're going to keep adding VLANs to the trunk and we just want to keep it wide open at this point. And then the last command is spanning tree port fast trunk so that way the port doesn't have to wait for the spanning tree to complete and can come up immediately. Make sure you have that option trunk at the end. Not just the port fast because it's not an access port, but it's a trunk port. Okay, so depending on what switch you are using, the syntax might be slightly different, but the whole concept of having these commands should be the same. For example, some switch these days only support dot one q so you may not need to enter or actually switch wouldn't even take this command right here at all. And some of the switch also it does not refer to a port fast uh, port anymore it becomes like a port type edge okay, so it depends on what switch you're dealing with all right so we're just going to give it a couple seconds here for our controller you can see in the background it's trying to boot up what we can do is to have our ping going so ping 172.16.32.104 again just to kind of remind ourselves we're sitting here on our windows 2008 which is the ip.40 on vlan 32 trying to ping control on the same VLAN. I guess I should do dash T. There you go. Actually, the last ping already gone through. And you can see now the controller is pingable. Okay, so once the controller is done booting up, again, one thing to notice here, comparing this output from uh, with what we had earlier, I'm not sure if it kind of went off the screen already. Maybe you have a large enough buffer right here, where at the end, it starts enabling the controller provisioning feature. But now that once it's, the system is fully initialized, it no longer goes through that process. Okay, so it just went directly into the command prompt. Lock in with our admin account with the credential we provided during the setup, and we should be at the Cisco controller prompt. All right, so that's for the command line. I'm just going to keep that console kind of open. Now we're going to try to get into the GUI. So I have a kind of shortcut uh, up here already for our controller. Click I understand the risk with the untrusted warning, add exception, confirm, and now we can lock into the GUI. Same username, password, admin, enter. Do not remember password. And now what the first thing you see is the network summary page. And this page right here is kind of specific to the 2500 series wise line controller. If you're trying to use a, or you're using a different version of controller or a different model of controller here, you, the page might appear as a little differently. So let's go ahead and click on advanced. We're just gonna come back and revisit this in a later videos and kind of review it fully. But for now, let's go ahead and bypass that and get into what might look more familiar to you, which is our regular web interface for a Cisco Wireless 9 controller. As you can see here, we have four physical ports on our controller. The first two ports actually connect to the switch right now. The third one is where the APs are connected to, which is port three. What we want to make sure is our AP actually came up and registered to the controller. So by default, when you have the APs directly connected to these two PoE ports, again, specific to the 2500 series controller, the default VLAN would be the management VLAN that you initialize during the setup process. 
for us, which is our VLAN 32. So we need to make sure us is our VLAN 32 is set up with the DHCP server. So that way, when the AP is trying to come up on that VLAN, it'll be able to grab the IP and register it. So currently we have our switch one here kind of configured for the DHCP server for VLAN 32. So let me show you how our scope is currently set up. Let's take a look at begin of DHCP. Let's search for VLAN 32 right here. Default route pointing to the switch itself, 32.1. So we've got domain name, DNS server, and we've got an exclude address for 32 starting at dot one to dot two forty. So we should be or our AP should be receiving an IP that's higher than two forty. So let's check on that under the wireless tab. Right here we've got our AP. You can see that it hasn't been configured with the its own MAC address being a AP name. The IP it grabbed is dot two forty five. So it looks like it might have tried a couple of times before it finally registered. That's why it's not grabbing anything immediately after two forty. So dot two forty five. So now that we know that our AP has successfully registered to the controller, and we'll again have a separate video talking about the AP registration process. But for now, we have AP directly connected. So as long as the AP grabs the IP, it should register. Let's take a quick look as the general overview of the controller here. It tells you the management IP address. This is again the monitor summary page. The current software version is 8.1.102. Tells you system name, uptime, the exact system time, which is not quite correct. You can compare it to the local time on our 2008 server here. It looks like we haven't set the time zone yet. That's why it's a little bit ahead. And then just general state of the radio. These are the kind of things that we configure during the setup process. Monitor, uh, mobility group, CPU usage, memory usage, so on and so forth. All right, then we can, for example, look under the statistic and the controller. These are some of the number of packets that are coming in or going out the controllers. Type of packets. Number of VLAN supported, number of VLAN use. Last clear counter. Okay, then we can take a look at the status of the port. So here as shown on the first page, we have three ports in use right now. The first two are connected to the switch, and the third being the APs. Okay, which is running one gig right now. Okay, the fourth is unused, is, remains linked down. Then we go into the CDP just to look at the exact neighbor ports. So first two ports and neighbors are the switch one. Okay, port five and six. And then the third is pointing to the AP gig zero. Okay, before moving on, I want to last show you the controller inventory, which is where you come in and grab the UDI information. So product identifier, serial number obviously, and these are the information you might need later on when you're trying to register the AP license. So this is where you come in and grab those uh, information. All right, so that's pretty much it for the method one, which is using command line interface. Now we're gonna move on to method number two, which is initialization through the GUI using wired ethernet.